Hi, Rod. Hello, Amy. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Just great. It finally got to be cool weather down here in Texas, so uh, fall finally arrived just at the at the end of October. So. That's good. Yeah, well, we've finally gotten fall here, too, and that's a little unusual for us in D.C. Yeah, well, let's, um, we got a lot to talk about today. I, I was really uh, amazed by this this piece in the Wall Street, I'm not the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times Magazine yesterday about mm-hmm. David Kirkpatrick's piece about the evangelical crack up. What did you think? I thought it was a really, really smart piece. Um, and uh, we should stay at the outset, um, I guess, for our viewers who don't know both of us, uh, that I'm Amy Sullivan. I'm the nation editor at Time Magazine, and uh, I have covered religion and politics issues mostly from the left. Um, and you, I suppose, would be my counterpart then. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. We should have done the introductions first. I'm Rod Greer. I'm a columnist at the Dallas Morning News, a veteran of National Review and conservative journalism, a a religious conservative. I'm an Eastern Orthodox Christian, and uh, I'm the author of a book called Crunchy Cons, which uh, talks about uh, countercultural conservatism, sort of got me a little bit of heat from the standard issue uh, Republicans. Well, as long as you're going to do a book plug, I'll do mine as well, uh, that I have a book, The Party Faithful, coming out in February, that I will uh, go on the record as predicting here will get me some heat <laughs> from people on the <laughs> left uh, for giving kind of a history of how Democrats lost evangelical and Catholic voters, uh, but also a happy ending somewhat at the end of the story about how they may get them back. Um, and this Kirkpatrick article that you mentioned um, is kind of a, a piece of that in looking at what's happening in the evangelical community and something you've written a lot about, about whether evangelicals um, are still sticking strong with Republicans um, this time around and whether they should even, I think, is the question that's raised by that article. Well, you're right. And, I, you know, it's interesting, to I was at a Wendell Berry conference in Louisville a couple of weeks ago, and um, I was talking with a, a conservative professor and uh, who said that whenever he, he's a traditionalist like I am, who mm-hmm. we tend, we're morally conservative and religiously conservative, but tend to be less, uh, less Republican on economic issues and things like that. And uh, he mentioned to me that whenever he goes out and talks to audiences of mixed ages, like you know, older conservatives and younger uh, college students and you know, middle-aged conservatives, the older ones always tune him out when he starts criticizing the economy, particularly in religious terms. Hmm. But the younger ones want to know more. And that's been exactly my experience in talking to conservative audiences, especially conservative religious audiences. The over 40s, they, did, they don't want to hear anything, uh, anything that contradicts the Republican gospel. Mm-hmm. But the younger ones, whenever I start talking in conservative terms about how we need to do more for the environment and we need to have a different economic uh, policy, they want to know more about that. And I think you really saw that coming through in the Kirkpatrick article. Yeah, that's really interesting. In fact, I would love to see, and I'm hoping, in fact, to write uh, a piece looking at that uh, generational divide in the evangelical community, because I think you've just put your finger on something that's really happening at a lot of Christian campuses around the country, uh, where you see a lot of what might in the past have seemed like liberal political activism against the war, um, a lot of students pushing for their campuses to go green uh, when it comes to the environment. Um, and getting involved in anti-poverty efforts, and certainly the short missions that a lot of kids are doing over their spring breaks or in a January term are putting them, you know, face-to-face with poverty and with overseas issues in a way that they just hadn't been before and that maybe, you know, the older members of their uh, religious communities haven't experienced themselves. Well, I think it's certainly true that the Democrats have a better chance now than they have had in many years to uh, to peel away some of the religious conservative vote but it's not going to be it's not a simple matter of, of uh, religious voters switching from Republican to Democrat. I, I believe it was the Pew Research data recently that showed that there has been certainly a falling away of evangelicals from yeah. the Republican Party but they haven't necessarily been picked up by the Democrats and You're right. when, when I read that I, I thought about a, an email I got from someone at a I think it was Fuller Seminary when I did my first CrunchyCon cover story for National Review, in which, again, I talked about, uh, from a conservative point of view, why there's a conservative reason to be more engaged in, uh, in being suspicious of big business or being pro-environment, things like that. 
I got an email from a seminarian who said, thank you so much for writing that. I've been, a lot of us out here are, consider ourselves conservatives. And uh, Jim Wallace had recently come out to speak to us, he said. And we agree with everything he was saying about how the gospel ought to, we ought to broaden our concerns as, as Christians. The gospel commands, that, uh, commands us to do that. But then when he got to the end of his speech and said, and that's why you should become Democrats, he lost us because, said my correspondent, we're conservatives. We just want to find a way within the conservative intellectual tradition and the conservative religious tradition to expand our concerns beyond what our uh, the previous generation had done. Well, and that's going to be a key question, I think, for a lot of religious voters in this upcoming election. And I'm curious as to you know, how you're thinking about this in terms of whether there is a candidate who marries those two. Um, and in fact, if there's not, who comes closest to that? Because um, you know this may be slightly off topic, but I think it's um, somewhat related. That there was a quote that really caught my eye from the Kirkpatrick article um, when he talked to Tony Perkins, who strongly implied um, that folks who um, are more like the crunchy cons that you've talked about um, are in fact theologically weak and are moving away from the evangelical community. He compared it to the split um, between mainline Protestants and evangelical Protestants around the um, turning of the 20th century um, and implied that, uh, in fact, folks who are, are moving more, not even to the left, but, as you say, embracing a different kind of politics uh, are moving away from Orthodox Christianity. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point, and it's a little bit difficult for me to answer because I never have been an evangelical. I'm, I'm an Orthodox Christian now. I was a Catholic for many years, and there is no natural split uh, in Catholic and Orthodox Christianity uh, of the sort you see in, among evangelicals. Like, you know, if you are a conservative Orthodox evangelical, then you would vote Republican, and right. you know, if you're more progressive, you vote Democratic. Uh, in fact, um, I, I wrote my book, Crunchy Cons, about... Uh, based on my Catholic my Catholic worldview, and it didn't change really when I became an Orthodox because they're very close there and that there is a more organic, no, no pun intended, more organic understanding of the relationship between faith and the good society. And uh, unfortunately, in American political terms, uh, we religious voters, at least those coming from my perspective, have had to choose between you know, abandoning some of our values to favor others. I mean, I've always voted pro-life because, to me, you know that that is the most fundamental issue. If you cannot be pro-life, then nothing else matters. Well, now we have the war in Iraq, and uh, you know, as we talk, my my brother-in-law is in Baghdad, uh, serving with his National Guard unit. And uh, as I've gotten a little bit older now, I'm 40 years old. I have kids and all that, and I begin to see uh, healthcare issues as being being huge. And and these are gospel issues. I mean, the left has been saying this for a long time, um, and. It start, finally started to occur to me as, as I've matured you know, as, a, as a husband and as a father and as, as I think a citizen, if that doesn't sound too pretentious to say. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to say that these folks are, are, are not deep uh, uh, theologically because I don't know evangelicals enough to, to say. But certainly if you are deep theologically as a Catholic or an Orthodox, then uh, the sort of thing, the sort of convergence that's happening now may, just makes sense. Yeah, well, I have to say, you know, I read that and had a really strong reaction against it, um, just because, uh, I guess, for two things. One is what I've really started to notice over the last few years is that the change we're seeing, what's different now from the last, you know, 30 years when someone like Jim Wallace um, has been pretty much just preaching the same sermon for the last 30 years and he's just now getting attention, is that he and Rick Warren and Bill Hybels are guys who are pretty theologically orthodox. They're not offering a kind of wishy-washy theology, and yet they're expanding their politics, and in Walsh's case, it's where he's always been, uh, more to the center and to the left. And I think that fits a need um, and meets a lot of Americans where they are, where they didn't want to have to make a choice, uh, either to go with their politics or to go with their theology. And I would just say that my second point there is just a personal one, which is I grew up in a pretty uh, liberal democratic household and uh, went to a pretty conservative evangelical church, and I thought of myself as an evangelical. And around the time that I left to go to college, I started to pull away from that label simply because I made the mistake a lot of people did of conflating that 
uh, with politics. And I think a lot of voters um, who grew up in my same tradition ended up going the other way that I did. They became uh, much more conservative politically than maybe that they naturally would have been because that seemed like the right link to them. Uh, for me, I pulled away from my religious tradition because it, it seemed as if it didn't match where it was politically. And it's only been in the last few years that I've been able to realize, no, I'm actually I'm still an evangelical. Um, and it's possible to be an evangelical and be kind of centrist or liberal politically. In fact, if you look at those Pew Research Center numbers, there are about 14, 15 million of us. We're just <coughs> not a small chunk of people. But you know, one thing I noticed in that Kirkpatrick piece, he, uh, he talked about how, uh, there's a quote here somewhere, I, I've written it down, but uh, the, one of the, uh, the, the preachers, uh, evangelical preachers interviewed, said that um, you know, we are expanding, uh, we conservative evangelicals are expanding our understanding of, of what the gospel requires of us uh, politically. Uh, he said that there are two kinds of, two forms of the gospel, the social gospel and the personal gospel. And, and his point seemed to me to be that they were, they, the evangelicals have always taken the personal gospel very seriously and now right. they're expanding to add on the social gospel, at least among conservatives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's right. But what, what, what keeps me from becoming a Democrat and for identifying with them, even though I find a lot of common ground on some issues, is that uh, I wonder if the, the progressive, religious progressives, would ever take the personal gospel seriously in the sense that religious conservatives, evangelical, mm -hmm. Catholic, Orthodox, would understand that. In other words, uh, will if the religious right is moving toward accepting more responsibility for the poor, uh, for, the, for the environment, and, and these things, which I think are good, Will we see the religious left moving toward a more pro-life position, a more traditional position on, say, marriage or, or these traditional moral issues? Mm -hmm. I don't really see that happening. Do you see any signs of that happening, or do you think it should happen? Well, yeah, those are two different questions. And I guess I would say um, it, it would be um, less of an issue for me whether... Um, whether the religious left was moving in that direction or than whether the Democratic Party was. And I think mm -hmm. those are obviously two very separate um, organisms and movements. Um, but to the second half of your question, um, I, I think that the Democratic Party is changing its approach to abortion, uh, which is different from changing its position, but it's still an important shift. And by that I mean that you hear a lot of Democrats, and certainly the front runners um, this time around in the presidential side, talking about how to reduce abortion rates. Um, and it's dismissed a lot as um, just, you know, too clever by half and not quite getting where pro life voters want them to be. Um, but, you know, if you take just the example of teen pregnancy over the last 10 or 15 years, it's been a combination of uh, increased access to contraception, but also kids having less sex. That, you know, conservative abstinence does, in fact, work and has worked with kids over the last 15 years. And as a result, we've seen about a 35% drop in teen pregnancies and a, a corresponding drop in teen abortions, uh, which I would say is a, a pro-life outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that Democrats are starting to talk about in a way that just wasn't um, necessarily welcome on the left for a long time. Well, you know, you're, you're, I think that's good, and I, I, I hope to see more of that. But, you know, I, I frankly don't trust it when I hear Democrats talk about change their rhetoric, because I, I'd like to see them actually do something that uh, take any sort of policy position. Okay, well say, then, I, go ahead. I would just uh, point out that there is a corresponding policy position here, because I think you would be right to be suspicious if this was just the way people were talking about it. Uh, but there's some legislation in the House that's been uh, co-sponsored by the pro-choice Rosa DeLauro, a Catholic Democrat, and the pro-life um, Tim Ryan, who's a, uh, a Catholic Democrat as well, um, precisely to put together policy packages that would reduce abortion rates, both um, on the prevention side, but also by providing resources to women who get pregnant and decide that they really want to have their babies. Uh, they're just not sure if they can afford to do that on their own. Um, and, you know, it raises all sorts of issues um, on, I think, both sides um, of the issue. But it, it at least provides a starting point, I think, for people who want to reduce those abortion rates and want to see a real way to do it. And Hillary Clinton, by the way, is a co-sponsor of that legislation in the Senate.
Well, that's good to hear. And I, I, I perhaps should say that why I, I have, as a social and religious conservative, lost so much faith in the Republican Party is because they, they've talked for so long about what we're going to do, what we're going to do, what we're going to do mm-hmm. uh, to advance these uh, conservative uh, social policy goals. You know, and then they get in, and I remember Bush ran in 2004. You'll remember how the gay marriage thing, they hit that hard. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, so it gets, gets reelected, and then suddenly the federal marriage amendment comes up, and all Bush could bring himself to do was to come out and make a statement and then back down, and clearly his heart wasn't in it. He didn't want to support this thing. The Republicans couldn't even get this out of the Senate. Well, fine, if that's what they, they believe, that's what they believe. Um, but... That's not what they campaigned on. And I, and I finally, I, I realized that when that happened, like, you know what, they are just playing religious conservatives. They don't really mean this. Mm-hmm. They, they, they say these things to get votes, but in the end, it's not going to matter that much to them. And the whole Harriet Myers thing, too. I mean, the, the best thing that conservatives, religious and social conservatives, got out of this administration were Sam Alito and John Roberts. But we wouldn't have gotten one of them if it had been up to Bush, who put his, his hat crony in there. He wanted her in there. And it's... I think that this is what's happened a lot on the, on the religious right now is uh, we just realize what have we gotten out of this marriage with mm-hmm. the Republican Party? And I think it is a healthy thing that the evangelicals and the religious right are cracking up, not only because I'd like to see the issues I care about as a, as a Christian and as a conservative uh, addressed more by the Republican Party, but because you know, somebody said in that Kirkpatrick piece, you know, when you marry religion and politics, you get politics. And I'm just awfully tired of feeling that uh, that we on the religious right are beholden to the Republican Party, which has not done right by us, I would say. Well, and do you think that's because Republicans have taken Christian conservatives for granted and they figure, where are you going to go? You don't have another option, so yeah. you will take what we give you. Oh, I think it's absolutely true. Uh, I mean, because the, the Democrats have been so, at least at the national level, have, have come across as so hostile to religion uh, and, and when they have in the past uh, done, uh, tr- tried to get religious, you know, it's just been a joke. And you, you, you know, you're a religious person yourself. You know how fraudulent some of this stuff has sounded. And, yeah, uh, although I have to say, one of the most fun chapters I wrote for the book was on the Clinton administration. And uh, that's obviously a tricky topic because of Clinton himself. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, the last two years of his administration probably have colored the way we look at him. Uh, but he was, without a doubt, the most overtly religious president. Spoke about religion more even than than Bush has. Um, and one of my theories has been that, in fact, it was uh, liberals running away from his record that allowed Bush to come out and kind of capture the religious ground the way that he did. I think he would have tried to do that anyway. Uh, but when he spoke up and said, you know, we're all for faith-based initiatives, this anti-religion Clinton administration has been discriminating against religious groups, instead of saying, absolutely not, here's what the Clinton administration has done with faith-based initiatives, here's how they've worked with them, here's what he's done to actually advance the cause of religious liberty, liberals stood up and said, well, you're damn right, we discriminate against religious groups, we have separation of church and state, we're not giving them money. Hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting because, as you know, from most evangelicals or many evangelicals take the personal religiosity of a candidate to be uh, determinative. Right. I mean, I can't tell you, living down here in Texas, how many times I've heard Bush praised as being a man of God. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can talk about how that has resulted in different policy things that may not be consonant with the gospel, and it doesn't quite seem to matter because he makes a personal testimony of faith. That seems to be all a lot of people want to hear. And you bring up somebody like Clinton, who was quite clearly a man who didn't live in his personal life by uh, by gospel values, but he, uh, which obscured in, in in the eyes of many some achievements he may have actually made for the cause of religious liberty. I think that's a really interesting point. Okay, well, I'm going to press you on something here before we move on to our next topic because it's always fascinated me uh, that. Many conservative political leaders don't live by gospel values in their own personal lives either, and they're able to use that as an expression of how truly Christian they are because they recognize their sinful beings and that none of us is perfect, and that's used as an opportunity to kind of um, uh, to focus and emphasize on uh, their faith and how they've fallen and uh, come back. Um, and yet with Clinton, it's seen almost as proof of uh, that he's not really religious, that it was insincere, and that if he did talk about his faith, that he clearly didn't mean it. What's what's going on there? 
<laughs> well, it, this could be a, an example of the old, uh, the old, what's the line about hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. I, I think that a lot of evangelicals, a lot of Christians, uh, like no story more than the, than the repentant sinner story. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and I think there must be truly some hypocrisy there because look at Newt Gingrich. I mean, how, how he can even get a, uh, a, an audience with the religious conservatives now considering the way he's lived his life privately is just mm-hmm. astonishing to me. And the fact that any religious conservative, if they were going to be true to their, to their values, the same things that had them push Clinton aside, how they would even consider voting for Rudy Giuliani. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just breathtaking to me. So I, I agree yeah. with you. There's some, there's some hypocrisy there on the right. And, and you're really seeing this, uh, go back to the Giuliani thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if religious conservatives in this country, the evangelicals, were going to be true to form and true to what they say they believe, they should all be behind Mike Huckabee. But they're not, because in part, they don't believe Mike Huckabee can win. And what does that say about how, how truly we believe in, our, in, in principle or whether it's just a matter of power politics? Right. Well, let's make that our next topic, uh, okay. because that was fascinating to me, listening to him at the Values Voters Summit. That was the explicit appeal he made, was you need to put your principles ahead of your politics. And I, I lo- it was like sitting in church and listening to a sermon, the way he said, you either choose to be with David or with Goliath. You're either with Elijah or the prophets of Baal. You know, he just went through the litany, and his point was, you stand with me, the little guy, because the little guy has been counted out before, but when his cause is just, he can win. Um, and it remains to be seen whether that appeal actually works in the Iowa caucuses. Uh, but it was a powerful one to the folks in the room. Yeah, and uh, but you know, you're in that Kirkpatrick story too, which is, I think there's going to be a lot of talk about this story for a long time, but, uh, about how uh, the so many evangelicals are behind Giuliani. And uh, because, and not for discreditable reasons, because they believe that you know, terrorism is the is a is a huge issue right. now, and maybe the most important issue, and they trust that he will be able to keep the country protected more than the uh, the, the Baptist pastor Mike Huckabee. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I got real problems with Giuliani. I would never vote. I would have voted for him for mayor of New York. I used to live in New York. He was mm-hmm. my mayor. He was a great mayor for New York City. But I've got huge problems with him in terms of his temperament and what he believes. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't care how many times he's been married and divorced. I think he would be a really, really, really bad for this country. But um, do you think, Amy, that it's a good thing that evangelicals, conservative evangelicals, are are turning away from people like Huckabee and being willing to embrace somebody like Giuliani despite his um, his pretty disreputable moral life uh, because they happen to like his positions. I mean, it, it's kind of a weird thing for both conservatives and liberals because maybe on one hand you would say that it's a good thing that, uh, that uh, evangelical voters, conservative voters are becoming more pragmatic. On the other hand, it really does kind of stink of hypocrisy, doesn't it? Well, it stinks of hypocrisy, so definitely looking at the last few decades, uh, it's a little frustrating to see. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, uh, because I have been a little distressed by the move more and more towards identity politics, and then in turn uh, what that means in terms of politicians making appeals based on their personal faith. Uh, I think it's something that voters have a right to know about if politicians want to talk about what's the, uh, the moral foundation for their beliefs and their policy positions is. Um, but it's made me a little uncomfortable, for instance. I read an article a few months ago uh, that quoted a voter in um, Iowa who I think uh, the article was, uh, there was a brief moment over the summer when Huckabee and Brownback were kind of at each other, um, claiming that the other person wasn't conservative enough. And this voter was an evangelical who said, well, I'm going to back Huckabee, but it's because he's an evangelical and I figure my Catholic friends will back Brownback because he's Catholic, and I assume Mormon voters will back Mitt Romney because he's Mormon. Um, and that seemed like an unfortunate way uh, to break down the field, that you're just going to add up with the percentages of religious voters <laughs> in, the, in the electorate, and then there you have it. Um, so in that sense, I, I'm not too uh, upset to see evangelicals breaking out uh, for candidates who are not necessarily like them and, and in turn not getting behind Huckabee. Uh, but it, it is a serious question, I think, of uh, whether you can afford to do that flip back and forth too many times. Yeah, I mean, I, I found it so fascinating in that story how um, some of the evangelicals said they would never vote for Hillary Clinton, but they would consider voting for Obama. 
Mm-hmm. And I've had that same thought myself. I mean, I, I'm, I feel like I'm probably not going to vote for president in 2008 because of... Uh, I do feel strongly about the life issue, and there's not enough to distinguish on the issue of the war, which is a huge issue for me. I've been disappointed by some of the things I've heard from the Democrats. But Hillary Clinton is absolutely off the table for me. There's just too much baggage really? there. But and why is that? Why is that? Because I, I think we've seen her. Well, well for one thing, I, I, I don't want to relive this constant Bush-Clinton, Bush-Clinton mm-hmm. thing. I, wanna, I want there to be a break from the past. I, I don't trust her. I think she's calculating I think she will be uh, every bit as calculating as George W. Bush has been, except she'll be smarter about it. And uh, I, I just don't trust her character. Barack Obama, though, I mean, I, even though I won't vote for him for political reasons, if he became president, there'd be a little part of me that would be, be happy with that, not only because I, I think he's a, he's a man who speaks in very hopeful terms and he, he would be a change politician, but because I think that he would help us have a different conversation about race in this country. And whatever bad things from a conservative point of view he could bring in terms of policy, my, man, if he could just he could get us off the dime uh, on race, I think he would do this country so much good. And I think that's probably what a lot of evangelicals are, are, are looking at. I mean, Hillary is so established on the religious right as this, this, this scare figure that uh, a lot of people just can't vote for her. But Obama, even though he may have the same politics Mm -hmm. as her, same position as as she does on issues that have traditionally been important to the religious right, the fact that he's a different different man, and I think the fact that he's a black man, Mm -hmm. uh, helped his cause a lot. What do you think about this whispering campaign that's already underway against him in kind of conservative circles? I know there's an email circulating, uh, raising lots of various questions about... Uh, his childhood in Indonesia and attending uh, what the, is called a madrasa. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've certainly had people in public events come up to me and say, you know, they don't trust Barack Hussein Obama. I know. It, I, you know I've heard the same thing, and it's so depressing and so mm-hmm. stupid. I, I was on the uh, phone with somebody I know when we were talking about this, and uh, somebody who uh, a longtime friend and uh, who was uh, an, older, an older man and is Christian, and I said, well, you know, Barack's a Muslim. I'm like, no, he's not. He's a Christian. And then, so we went back and forth. I know you've heard this whole thing. And it's, it, it's they're immovable. It's, yeah. uh, they just can't trust him. And these are the same people often who will say they wouldn't vote for Mitt Romney, no matter how conservative he is, because he's a Mormon. Mormon. And that's just right. something I don't get. So do you assume that those folks are, are people who would never vote for a Democrat in general? Or is that something that Obama would actually have to address? Because it seems lose-lose. That if you have to stand up, and it's like, you know, declaring that you don't beat your wife. You mm-hmm. know, standing up and declaring that you're not, in fact, a Muslim then raises that issue for a lot of people who hadn't heard it. Yeah. I think that by the, if he should get the nomination, that uh, he's going to have to take have to answer this in some way. And I think it, he could probably handle it pretty well if he just kept talking about his faith, mm-hmm. um, his Christian faith. And, and I don't think it's a pandering thing for him. I think it's legitimate for him from everything I've read about him. Mm-hmm. You know, his his progressive uh, take on Christianity is not my own, but I, he speaks to, to my ears with conviction. And I, I think mm-hmm. that uh, I think he could easily handle this situation. As I told my friend, I, I said, look, you know, Barack comes from, his father was a Muslim, but his father abandoned the family when he was a little boy. You can't hold that kid responsible for that. Besides, he's, he has converted to Christianity and did so before he ran for national office. So uh, I, I think that um, I think there will be certain people who will never vote for him because of that, but they're not likely people who would have voted for a Democrat in the first place, don't you think? I, I think that has to be. Um, and you're right that he has a very kind of seamless way of talking about it. it it's fascinating to me that he's our first major presidential candidate who grew up in a completely secular home um, and who's an adult convert to Christianity. I just, I think that gives him a way of talking about it and a freshness with it um, that we just haven't seen before and that may be in part an explanation for for the kind of ease and comfort with which he talks about it. Um, But it's also very interesting to me that you mentioned his progressive Christianity um, I would bet you that Hillary Clinton is closer to where you are in terms of theology than Obama is, um, and yet you're much more comfortable with the idea of a President Obama. Well, because I, I just don't trust Hillary Clinton's character. I mean, I think <laughs> Rose Law Firm records and all that. I was in Washington back during the, <laughs> during those days, and uh, the battle of years. I, you know, a I don't trust her, and b 
I, I think it would be absolutely horrible for the Republican Party if Clinton became uh, became president, Hillary Clinton did, because the Republican Party and the conservative media would go right back into the whole American spectator, mm -hmm. uh, David Brock mode of attack, attack, attack. And you know, as, a, as a Republican and as, and as a conservative, I, I, I expect the Republican Party to be smashed in 2008. And, and I... I frankly, I'm not that depressed about. It. I've learned to accept it. I've gone, I've gone past the anger and, and, and denial and anger, and I've learned to accept it because I think it will actually help us in the end if we confront some of these problems with our own, our own thinking and our own approach to things, and uh, and come back in 2012 with maybe a, a new vision. But if Hillary Clinton is elected, we're going to hear nothing but hate Hillary, hate Hillary, hate Hillary, and it will, it will enable our worst instincts on the on the right. And uh, President Obama wouldn't do that. I think he would force us to do some more creative thinking. Hmm. Well, uh, that would be interesting to see if they couldn't help themselves, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, of course we can't help ourselves. What are you What are you talking about? It'll just be... Uh, I'm afraid we'll turn into uh, into what, um, you know, the D Daily Coast people. It'll just be non-stop Hillary bashing, and it won't do our party any good, it won't do the conservative movement any good, and it won't do our country any good, frankly. Well, you had mentioned uh, in passing uh, a couple of minutes ago the issue of Mitt Romney's Mormonism yeah. and whether that is going to be a factor in the Republican primaries. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about it because this is something, you know, as you know, I've written about um, a, a few years ago saying that I, I thought that was going to be a stumbling block for a lot of conservative evangelical voters. Um, it started to seem like it wasn't. You know, he was doing very well in Iowa and New Hampshire and is still ahead by quite a bit in New Hampshire. But I wonder if this still isn't going to be something that comes up um, at that last minute when people are in the voting booth, um, and particularly in places like South Carolina, where it, it definitely is not just being whispered about but talked about openly. Boy, I think it surely will. I mean, I, I tell you, living here in Dallas, uh, which is probably the biggest evangelical city in, in, in the country. Uh, it, it is huge. The, the pastor of First Baptist Church here uh, recently, the formerly known as the Baptist Vatican, uh, recently told his congregation, if you want to vote for a Christian, if it's important you to vote for a Christian, then you can't vote for Mitt Romney. Now, I think there are very strong theological arguments about why, about why Mormonism does not, does, is not Christian. You know, uh, it's, it's not Trinitarian. It's, it, it's clearly, in my view, not Christian, but I would vote. I'm not going to vote for Romney, but I'm not going to vote for him because I don't. I don't like his politics. And I don't like his, his political stances. His Mormonism matters not one bit to me. But it, it's amazing as I get out and talk to conservative friends, Christian conservative friends. He may as well be a Scientologist because they just feel like they cannot support him. And I, I that that mystifies me. But it is such a, a deeply held belief that Romney has got to address it. He's got to give one of these JFK type speeches about it. But can he give a speech like that? Because what's really interests me about Mormonism is it's very different from the the situation that Kennedy faced, and that in with anti-Catholicism, a lot of it was based on misinformation about mm -hmm. Catholics and misunderstandings. And there, learning more about it, hearing Kennedy talk about his relationship to his faith and the lines that he drew, actually did put some voters at ease. Whereas with anti-Mormonism, it's practically the only bias where learning more about it actually makes people who were opposed more opposed. That's because a really great point. they have kind of a vague sense that Mormonism might be a little weird to them and that they might not agree with things, but they don't really know the specifics of it. And I think the one thing he can't do is get into the specifics. And I don't know if a vague discussion of his faith, because that's been kind of the level on which he's left things, will actually put any voters who had questions at ease. Well, let's talk about that. Let's see, w what way could he give that speech that would be effective? Because, you know, many of the the Mormons are the most, you know, quote-unquote, pro-family, con socially conservative uh, religious group in the country. I mean, e everything that that the evangelicals and religious right folks claim to, to admire about public behavior and private behavior, the Mormons have it in spades. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and I think if he would focus on, on that, uh, that that would be the, probably his best, his best, uh, it would. His, his best uh, strategy. But you're right, I mean, the more people talk about Mormon theology and the whole, the planets and the garments and this and that, 
it's, it, it freaks people out. It makes them think this really is a cult. And I, I, I don't think we'd have a, a single thing to fear from a, a Mormon presidency. In fact, as a conservative, he, he may well be more conservative than, uh, than an evangelical or a Catholic in the White House. But mm-hmm. uh, it is it's such an emotional issue with people. I mean, do you, can you see any way he could give a, a speech that might turn people around or at least peel a certain uh, significant number of them away? I think there is one way he could do it, um, but I don't know that it works given the way Republicans have set up our conversation about uh, religion and the public square over the last few decades, which is to say he had um, a really interesting debate that was captured on YouTube uh, a couple of months ago. I think it was right around the time of the Ames straw poll where he got into it with a conservative talk show host in Iowa And he explained what is, in fact, the policy of the church, which is that they don't take positions on political issues. I think there have only been four or five in church history that the church has actually said, this is where we stand. And they certainly, unlike Catholics, do not try to enforce a specific position, particularly among politicians uh, who are Mormon. And you'll see that, obviously, when you look at uh, Harry Reid, um, and Orrin Hatch, just the variety of Mormon politicians we have in U.S. politics right now. Um, and he, so he, he says very clearly, and he has good um, standing uh, to make this argument, that the church would not be able to step in and tell him that he had to uh, take a certain stand based on church teaching, which I think is something that was a little more difficult for Kennedy uh, to say. In fact, uh, mm-hmm. it's it's often uh, misinterpreted by Democrats, and I think they they forget that what Kennedy was saying was not that his faith um, didn't enter into who he was as a public figure and it meant nothing to him, but that, in fact, it was so important to him that if Catholic teaching were to conflict with something he was asked to do as president, he would resign the office rather than let the two of those come in conflict. Um, and, you know, that is not a question that Romney would face, but I'm not sure he can make that argument that his faith would not influence his politics uh, because, again, Republicans and conservatives in general have spent a lot of years arguing that your faith should influence your politics, that that's what really informs and makes who you are as a public official. You know, it's interesting. I was in, in talking about the whole Romney issue with uh, Christian conservatives, I asked them if they would vote for a, a Jew for for president, and many of them say, sure, no problem. I'm like, well, wait a minute, Jews aren't Christians. If you don't believe Romney is a Christian, you know, and that's going to keep you from voting for him, why wouldn't that same principle keep you from voting for a Jew? Mm-hmm. And I think what that, that question does is it, it, it just gets to the strangeness factor. Mm-hmm. You know, many people don't know what Mormons are. You know, they know about the Tabernacle Choir, they know about the Osman family, but that's about, that's where it ends. And uh, I, I think that maybe saying we won't vote for a Christian is just a way in their minds of, of, uh, of trying to find an acceptable way to deal with the fact that we think Mormons are weird. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Well, and you mentioned the family values, which it, it seems to be something that has really helped him in one direction. I mean, when you look at all the Republican candidates, and this may not be saying much considering who else is in the field, uh, but when it comes to you know moral character, Romney scores higher than anyone on the Republican or the Democratic side of the field. Uh, certainly when you ask who is most religious or seems <coughs> most religious, he really gets high points. But what you're pointing out is that may not necessarily help the way it has in the past. People may think he's religious, but not necessarily uh, think that that's a good thing, given what his faith is. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can see, I mean, we're starting to run out of time. I wanted to, um, to, to raise something. Sure. Uh, with you quickly, will it, will it throw us off if I throw something in? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I um, I'm going to give a speech in a few days to uh, a, a religious conservative audience here in Dallas, and it, it's at at my son's school. Uh, it's a, a Protestant school. It's a school I, I, I love. It's uh, for kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, it is a, ca- a consciously countercultural school. Most of the people who go there are are Presbyterians. It's a classical. It follows a classical model. But one of the things I love most about this school is uh, the fact that they will not allow the kids to talk about popular culture in the school. Uh, they don't say you can't watch movies or do anything like that. They say just don't bring it to the school. You can only talk about the books we're reading or things you know, think things like that that are approved. Mm-hmm. Now, half the people I tell about this school say, oh, man, that, that sounds like the police state. 
The other half say, oh, I wish my kid could go to a right. school like that. You know, because it, what the school's policy does is it helps parents like me and my wife who are raising our children, you know, without television, and um, we want them to learn to love good things. We, we're not, like, living in a bunker or anything. We just want them to learn to value reading and, and not be stuck in front of video games and television and all that. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, uh, I'm going to be talking about religion and politics and what we should, we because everybody there is going to be a, a Christian conservative, some of them Republican donors. And it's my view that uh, what we as religious conservatives should do is back away from party politics uh, and realize that uh, we have, it's kind of, uh, how do I put this? We have wasted our energy on trying to achieve cultural transformation through politics and haven't paid enough attention to to the culture itself and in non-political ways. I think things like this little school, which is just such a wonderful school, I mean, they're building the kids up with so much uh, love and appreciation for classical culture and for um, for art and, and literature and, uh, and giving them such a good alternative to the junk culture. I think this is what uh, we as, as conservative Christians ought to be doing, paying more attention to building up these institutions. I should say, too, this little school um, has a sister school in a poor part of Dallas that a lot of the families who go to this school donate time and money to to give the same kind of education to kids who can't afford it. Mm-hmm. So um, what... The, does that sound reasonable to you? Or what would be your comment on that, the idea that Christian conservatives could probably do more good building up in non-political institutions, taking some of that, that fervor and interest and money that we've been throwing at the Republican Party and instead building up local institutions and local networks? I think it makes a lot of sense. It's traditionally what conservatives um, have done. And as you know, where they have focused their energies is on building up uh, their own institutions, um, and, but not necessarily in always an insular way. Um, often, you know, looking at uh, the private sector um, as a way of um, building up society around them and being part of the community. I just worry whether that's possible at all anymore. Uh, but particularly possible in a year where, uh, if Hillary Clinton becomes the Democratic nominee. Um, I fear that that will be the overriding focus of conservatives and that um, as worthy as your effort is, uh, you will be pushing up against the tidal wave um, of (coughs) folks who are just kind of reacting against the left uh, rather than either trying to work for a new kind of politics or being able to kind of withdraw and focus on the community level instead. Well, you're right. If Hillary's a nominee, it's that, that... the, the anger and the, the, the reaction will be blinding in many ways. But I, I just think about about a year ago, I was here in Dallas at a, a meeting, a 10th anniversary dinner for Spence Publishing, which is a small publishing house here in Dallas, publishes most conservative titles and culturally conservative titles, very high-quality stuff. And they had a, after the dinner, they had a panel of Spence authors to take questions from the audience and have a discussion. And uh, someone from the audience asked, you know, where does the conservative movement go next? And the first one out of the box to answer the question was Phyllis Schlafly. And Phyllis, you know, she pounded the table and she talked about the public schools and the judiciary and the, the, the same stuff she's been talking about for, for decades. Mm-hmm. And I didn't necessarily disagree with it, Amy, but I thought, God, we've heard this so many times. I'm just so right. tired of this. Let's get something, let's have something new here. Mm-hmm. So the discussion moves down the, the panel, and then Tom Hibbs, who is a professor at, at Baylor, a Catholic uh, philosopher who heads at Honors College at Baylor, he said, you know, I think that we, have, we on the right have been spending way too much time on politics and not enough time building up the institutions that will transmit our cultural values, which we all agree are under assault by this, by this mm-hmm. society, that will transmit them intact to the next generation. And that's when the uh, a little light bulb went off over my head, thinking that, you know, that really is true. We, we have whined and whined and whined, we on the right, for so long about how our values are under attack, while not recognizing how some of the free market policies and the valorization of the free market economics on, that the Republican Party stands for, how that has served to undermine so many of the things we, we claim to value. Yeah. Well, and Rod, I think you've, <laughs> you've hit on something that may, in fact, find you um, some unlikely allies on the left. And I have to say, I have not seen a movement that has attempted to connect the two of them. Uh, But so much of what you say about the impact of the free market 
is what I heard growing up uh, in a pretty liberal high school with teachers who all went to the University of Michigan in the 60s and 70s, um, and who would probably never think uh, that they would have much in common with religious conservatives, and who yet have some of the same problems about um, you know, valuing people as commodities instead of mm -hmm. as people themselves. Um, and the last thing I'll say before we, we sign off on that is that um, in particular you might be interested in a movement it's fairly small right now but starting to gear up in anticipation of the annual uh, Bill Donahue War on Christmas uh, Fest <laughs> um, which is a bunch of religious progressives saying um, it, it's not Christmas the commercial holiday that we need to protect in fact they see that as a war on Christmas itself uh, because it prevents them and prevents uh, many religious Americans from focusing on uh, the actual theological significance of Christmas and replacing it with trees and candy canes um, and insisting that that itself is the representation of Christmas, which they would argue uh, is a, a kind of perversion of the concept. That's great. I'm so happy to hear that, Amy, because I, I saw the other night I got a screening copy of a, a new movie called What Would Jesus Buy? Have you heard of this? No, I haven't. Yeah, it's uh, Morgan Spurlock is one of the producers, you know, okay. the, uh, the super right. sizing guy. Sizing. But it's a documentary about the Reverend Billy, you know, the, the, oh, the Billy church Sunday. of stock yeah. shopping. Yeah. And it, it's kind of lighthearted. It kind of follows him on a tour, but it, boy, it raises some great questions that we on the religious right have not faced um, about the commercialization of Christmas hmm. and, and what that and the commercialization of, of our entire lives. And uh, I mean, I, I look at, as a prophetic figure here, Wendell Berry. Um, he is he, he has so he has friends on the right and friends on the left, but he doesn't satisfy everybody because he he's talked about how the Republican Party is basically the party of greed. It's sold out to commercial interests. He says, the, the, this, these are my terms, but he says that the uh, Democrats can be the party of lust. They won't give up uh, sexual freedom no matter what it costs the community. And uh, I find myself more and more agreeing with Wendell Berry that uh, as a Christian, that what we need to do is, be, is protect the community from things that corrupt the good life, whether they're uh, commercial uh, interest who, that, that ruin Christmas by making Christmas just an opportunity to shop and sell more crap, or, or whether it's other things too, and I, 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 I'm gratified by the response I've gotten from some on the left to my book Crunchy Cons because I do raise some of these issues about how I, as a conservative, take positions that, uh, in the American uh, political model, qualify as liberal. But uh, I'm not interested in in, in fighting these political values, uh, political battles with liberals as, as being uh, demonizing them. I'd rather be able to get together and say, look, what can we? We're not going to agree on everything, but what can we work on? that will bring us together and make some really positive change. And sometimes that's easier at the local level because you don't get these national groups in, on the left and the right who, whose bread and butter is demonizing the other side. Well, maybe we can get a, a Wendell Berry third-party candidacy that would bring people together from the left and the right. Oh, Amy, I'm going to uh, write him <laughs> in. I, I guarantee you that's what I'm going to do in 2008. I'm going to write that Not man in. Not a bad idea. <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, it's been a pleasure, Rod. This is fun. Yeah, let's do it again sometime. We should and, definitely uh, do it again. And uh, I, I hope that our paths will cross in this next political year. Okay, okay. Take, care. take care. Bye bye.